भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kostuba Das. Welcome to the show. It's the Bhagavatam show, and we are celebrating the first day of official lockdown for the state of New York, Illinois, and all of India. All of India is getting locked down. How do you lock down? Like villages. I don't know either, but they're locking down. I just got a message from my good friend from Radha Kund. They're locking them down. They're locking everybody down. I wouldn't mind being locked down in Radha Kund, perhaps. That would be a nice place to lock down. <laughs> it's a one-day right. lockdown in India. Yeah. Imagine that. Fate has you locked down in a holy place. Anyway, that's how we feel here at Super Soul Farm. We are in a holy place. Wherever you come together and glorify divinity... Glorify, uh, read the Bhagavatam. That place becomes a holy place. So we encourage your, we encourage you in your lockdown to make your lockdown place a holy place. Then you're locked down, right? You're locked down on pilgrimage. Your home becomes a place of pilgrimage. Um. So anyway, uh, how are you doing, Kostuma? Doing good. Doing good. No complaints over here. Happy to be with you. Happy to be with the Zoomers this morning. We've got a good group of Zoomers here. If you're new to the show, welcome. We have got about 89 people with us live on Zoom. Mara's here live, live. That's when you're in physical proximity where you can get touched. <laughs> Not that I will touch you. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Just meaning you're actually... Six feet of distance over there. Six feet of distance. I keep her. I have a six foot pole I keep her away <laughs> with in case she comes closer. So Michael. Yeah, I make sure she's slathered in dial antibacterial soap <laughs> before she walks in my door. I make her dip into a tub of hand sanitizer. <laughs> and I cover her with various masks like a mummy. <laughs> so she's here. Oh, that's why her voice may sound muffled. <laughs> and so... And I'm sipping a, a, a nice hot brew. My hair has become making a, a homemade a, um, medicinal mushroom brew. She's made her own. She's marketed her own. I put it to test here and made medicinal mushroom cough substitute. We got some <sighs> lagging going on there, Rubina. We're lagging, lagging on your connection. Are you you're hooked up well? Hooked up right? Hooked up. I even snuck around my household and turned every kid's device off and put it on airplane mode. And I still got a lag. I even called my internet company yesterday and said, I want the best. I want only the best here. And to give them one. And they came. I had a guy come to the house, check it out. And then he's like, now you got the best. There's only one more thing we could do for you and do that. Okay, we'll do one more thing. Last mute, hope. mute everyone's mic for a second, and then that might help. Okay. If you're new to the show, welcome. We do this kind of we're, we're, we're doing this type of stuff on a regular basis. I've muted everybody. I have to un, now. I unmute Kastuba. That's how okay. it works. There we go. So we are anyway i just want to encourage you if you in light of being locked down i know it's sometimes it's a little scary for some of us this is a grief when you're feeling a lot of anxiety and anxiety anxiety sometimes comes on we were saying we were yesterday one way to deal with um a panic is just to breathe just to take some time to breathe. If you're allowed to go out, skins can't even go outside so, so much um, legally. Get some time outside. Do some exercise if you can. If you're gonna watch the news, now I know the news is really important. 
because God knows what the hell we're watching on that news anyway. It's like, that's one of the biggest forms of anxiety. Who can I trust? Who can I trust here? So I'd say regulate it. Take care of your own immune system. You know, we have a responsibility of our own immune system, but the cleanliness of food we put in our body, um, um, our immune bo boosting herbs, and our vitamin C's and our zinc and our our uh, passive compulsive washing thing. It's it's getting crazy. My whole life is getting. I'm already obsessive compulsive, and I'm like washing. Don't no towels. Air dry the air. What about the door? How am I going to get that doorknob open? Supposed to open the doorknob. <laughs> <laughs> Then I like I gotta wash my elbows now. I gotta wash those elbows. <laughs> my kid can don't touch me. <laughs> so anyway, we're about to read the a great part of the stream of Bhagavatam. We're gonna dive. If you're um, anyway, we just want to say welcome to the show. It is um, you can reach us at wisdom of the one hundred eight at gmail dot com. The sage is one hundred eight at gmail. That's how you can connect with us. And also we have this great group and I'm celebrating today. I'm celebrating um, a lockdown by reading a uh, Krishna book tonight in Eastern time. Sweet baby Krishna. And you have to join our Patreon account, which is patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages and uh, come join our community. It's a chance for you to stream to uh, wisdom of the sages. If you feel so inspired, it helps support what we do. And me and Kostuber are taking this, Mara's taking this very and, uh, Bro, you are lagging bad today. <clears throat> I don't know what it is, but anyway. I'm having a good day, too. <laughs> Let's make do. We'll do our best with it. Okay. I apologize. Okay. We start with this prayer. Narayanam namaskritya naram chaiva narotamam devim saraswatim vyasam tatoja Starting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer obeisance to the Supreme Lord Narayan. Unto Narayan Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Yasadev, the author. Nasta Prayeshva Badre Shunicham Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtik by regular attendance in classes in the Bhagavatam and by rendering the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart will become eradicated, and loving devotional service to the transcendent Lord, who is praised with transcendental songs, will be established in the heart as an irrevocable fact. Omagyara Tamarandasya Gyaranjana Shalakya. Chakshur Melatam Yena Shri Gurave Namaha. Did that lag, Kastuba? Did it lag a little bit? I hate lagging. Thought you solved it, okay. huh? Still well, not. Solved. Is it raining over there? I don't know. No. No. All right. Anyway, let's go. A good one. Recall it. The virus is making the internet go slow. Okay. Text chapter A, text 34. Others say that the world, being overburdened like a boat at sea, is much aggrieved, and that Brahma, who is your son, prayed for you, and so you have appeared to diminish the trouble. Hmm. Oh, we read that yesterday. We did. Yeah. But there's a, um, if we look at the beginning of the commentary on this, mm -hmm. and again, we can just mention that the, the Mahabharata, and there's an overlap between the Bhagavatam and the Mahabharata taking place right here. Yeah. And, and so in the Mahabharata, it begins with the earth personified. You know, she, she approaches Lord Brahma because he's kind of like the lead person in the universe, you know? You, should, yeah. you go to the top of the universe, you get to Lord Brahma. And she says, um, it's just too much. I can't take it anymore. It's, I'm suffering because of all of these horrible 
um, horrible leaders, you know, people just completely out of touch, living in horrible ways, promoting po- horrible ideas. Um, you know, you know, there's a saying, you know, this one earlier, that the one thing that the earth can't bear, the one That's weight. Like ingratitude or a liar? One of those. A liar. Two. Yeah. A, a liar, you know. The earth and, cannot bear a liar. And sometimes these leaders are just the biggest liars, you know. And um, sometimes they even, even the way they speak, you're like, I don't trust you. You know what I mean? If you're watching like a, a debate, a presidential debate, yeah. there's like this instinctual, like, really? Other people, you're clapping? You believe this? <laughs> you really believe this? <laughs> He's like, am I the only one who thinks this guy's a liar? <laughs> So, but so the, the earth approaches Brahman and says, I just can't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. And so this is referring to that, this verse, others say that the world being overburdened like a boat at sea is much aggrieved and that Brahma, who is your son, the son mm-hmm. of, you know, because he's born from the Lotus, from Lord Vishnu, mm-hmm. who is your son prayed for you. And so you have appeared to diminish the trouble. And then the, the commentary starts, Brahma, or the first living being born, uh, just after creation, is the direct son of Narayan. Okay, so Narayan means Lord Vishnu. Mm-hmm. Narayan, as Garbho Dakshai Vishnu, first of all, entered the material universe. So, you know, it's described that Krishna, he's having his spiritual play. He's having his loving adventures in, in, the, in, a spirit, in the spiritual realm. And then because of the desire of certain living entities, within that spiritual realm, there's like a bubble of material world. And, and there's the uh, Maha Vishnu, the, f- the first expansion of Lord Vishnu. He, from him, all the u- many universes within that bubble develop, many meaning like unlimited. And then he enters into each one of those bubbles. So he penetrates on d- different levels. This is the Vedic paradigm of creation, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And so then inside each universe, he's, Garbo Dakshai Vishnu, he, from his navel grows the lotus and Lord Brahma takes birth on that. So he says, Narayan as Garbo Dakshai Vishnu, first of all, entered the material universe. Now, Prabhupada makes a, there's, there's a sentence here that he says, without spiritual contact, matter cannot create. Without spiritual contact, matter. It's a good point. It's a simple point and it's, it's so very, good. Yeah. Matter doesn't create anything. It, it's it's um it, you're right it's it's so it's such a simple point but it actually can you know even the most like well developed brains can can completely miss this point <laughs> <laughs> you know so she probably had that that one book was um, made called life comes from life which was a uh, great book simple easy read Simple, easy to read book, Life Comes from Life by Srila Prabhupada. It, it's, 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 I think it's con- it was conversations that he had with his yeah. disciples. Conversations right. with. Transcribed conversations that he had. But it's just going on this point that, you know, in a laboratory, you can't even create one blade of grass. Right? It takes that spark of spiritual energy. It takes that atma. That, that, a, that a seed can be created and be planted in the ground and grow. And that matter just doesn't start up on its own and start creating. It, it, there's, it, as we said a few episodes back, there's always a person behind it. Um, and, and so, you know, there is a scientific theory that matter just, that life comes from matter. That when matter gets complex enough, that, that consciousness develops out of it. Mm. And I tell you, these Vedic teachings are the thread that I always say this. I say this once a show. These Vedic teachings are the thread that ties all these paths together, I find. It's sort of like these Abrahamic traditions of worshiping one divine being. That, we, that sort of fits in with the Vedic paradigm. But to see spirit behind every being, even the, the houseplant, the sheep, your dog, a wolf, the earth itself, the planets, the wolf, a planet. <laughs> There's spirit behind There's this concept of like, oh, the, and, you know, these pagans, well, these pagans are also getting it. These pe- pagans are these spirit, 
Mm. They have this understanding. They're also, we can't just say there's one divine being and everything else is like a mundane backdrop. Everything else is also alive. Everything else is also spirit. And everything, I mean, just like if I look, work with uh, my wife, if I work with my uh, mother, if I work with a friend, every other spiritual being can assist me in some way. What to speak of? A divine spiritual being. I'm not going to write off every jiva, every spirit soul as being mundane and nothing, and we're just a speck of dirt. We're all spiritual beings, and of course, there is higher beings. We know that in this planet, there's people who are intellectually more savvy, physically more savvy. And then there is, of course, uh, in the universe, there's considered higher planets of higher beings. The Judeo-Christian culture would say angels, or, um, but in the Vedic system, it goes into different species of higher beings. And, different, and different, different beings on different planets. There's gradations of planets according to a person's spiritual maturity. And then there's not even of this world beings. And so I feel like the Vedic paradigm of reality is the thread that ties these together. And we say we need to connect with our highest, the highest source, but at the same time, I don't want to neglect that everybody else has divinity within them as well. It comes full circle. It comes full circle. And I learn to see divinity in every being, in the planet itself. It's the ultimate, like, in spiritual ecology or spiritual, uh, uh, real spiritual love between beings. Um, uh, that's why I love bhakti yoga. That's why I love it. That's why I love what I'm doing here. That's why I'm waking up at five in the morning to talk to, talk to a bunch of strangers from around the world. <laughs> the, the, you know, regarding life coming from life or the, the idea that life develops out of matter. Like, let's look at that, you know, Let, let's look at that. The idea that um, when matter, when the, the formations of matter become complex enough that they become conscious. And, you know, you can take, for instance, like you could take a computer and you could connect a camera to a computer and the camera serves as the eyes mm. and the computer is kind of like the, 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 you could say like the brain or the mind. And you could, then you could attach a speaker to that and that plays like the role of the voice. And you could program the computer that when you flash a red light in front of the camera, that the computer becomes triggered to respond by saying, I like red in a human sounding voice, right? You could do that. But then the question becomes, does the computer have the experience? Like you will see, Raghunath will, will open his eyes and see something that's red. Ooh. I see hair mustaches. Uh, <laughs> sweatshirt right now is, is red. So then you see that red and, and you have an emotion that's connected to that. You have a feeling you have an experience, you have consciousness and you have awareness that's connected to your emotions and you feel either I like red or I don't like red. Um, that's something that you experience. There's an experiencer behind your computer, like your mind is the computer and you experience the world through that computer and through the eyes, which are the camera. Now, what, what some scientists are saying is that the computer, when it says I like red, that it's conscious like you are. In other words, when you make, when you put it all together, when things get complex enough, when matter is, is formed complex enough, consciousness arises out of it. But we know it's not the same thing, don't we? I mean, isn't that simple to understand? That the computer is not actually, does not actually like red. It's mimicking a human experience by saying, I like red. But when we say, I like red, we actually have a feeling, we experience it, and there's no one experiencing it within the computer. So Srila Prabhupada in that book, he's kind of just making a simple argument about this. It goes different places, but, but could we really accept that matter has any experience at all or that consciousness comes out of matter? We don't see that. We see that consciousness comes from another conscious being. If we find anyone that's conscious, there was a conscious being before. Hmm. And then, of course, if you go back, 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 it's saying you go back far enough, you get to Narayan here. You know, the original consciousness. consciousness. Yeah. 
So life comes from life. It's worth checking out. Life comes from life. You know, I like the translation of the, uh, co- the uh, books that Prabhupada did that are just conversations. I think yeah. maybe because I'm a simple, I'm a simple man. And it, it's, <laughs> it's an easy read going yeah. back and forth. Okay. And, and yet others say that you appeared for the sake of rejuvenating bhakti, devotional service of hearing, remembering, worshiping, and so on in order that the conditioned souls suffering from the material pangs might take advantage and gain liberation. Mm. I've never used the word pang ever in my life except for (laughs) reading the Bhagavatam. Have you used the word tang before? I've used the word tang very often. (laughs) Honey, give me a glass of tang, please. (laughs) They drank it on the moon. <laughs> Are you guys setting up the internet booster? Is that what's going on? We're trying. Without Tom Essig here, we don't know how we're going to work it. But Yeah, so this is an important verse here. And I think this is the last in the series of verses where Kunti is speaking about the different reasons people say that Krishna appears. Okay. Um, but this one says, uh, you know, certain... certain f- important terms in the practice of bhakti if if you're if you consider yourself a practitioner of bhakti yoga then you should familiarize yourself with these terms if you got up if you got up at five in the morning to get on the show you're a practitioner of bhakti yoga okay whether you like it or not i mean you know some people are curious and some people are going to like dive deeper into that study and in the details but there's a word here shravana so shravana means to hear good word to know Put that on the board. And, 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 yeah. and in the context of um, bhakti yoga, it doesn't, it's not just like, you know, I heard any sound, but it's the process of hearing wisdom, the process of hearing the shastra, the, the, the sacred texts. And that can mean reading them with your eyes. That, that would be called hearing. And, um, w- or hearing from someone who's realized them, hearing them explained, hearing these books explained by someone. So that's called shravanam. Um, there's the, later in the Bhagavatam, we'll hear from one of the most amazing, wonderful characters in the Bhagavatam, Prahlad, right? Who's just a boy. And he gives the nine processes of uh, Bhakti Yoga. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smarnam, Parasevanam, Arjunam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmanavedanam. These nine different practices. So it starts with Shravan. It all begins with hearing. Um, and hearing leads, leads to the next word mentioned here, Smarna which means to remember. And and when we say remember, we can also think of that not just like we think of, oh, I just remember something, but remembering means like I consciously bring my mind to something that I've heard, right? So it means I'm gonna gonna choose what I meditate on. And the fuel, like you, you, I like how Raghunath says here a lot of times, you know, like what we consume, you know, that becomes the food for our mind. And so what what we hear, will determine what we can remember. And the, the more that we're hearing um, this potent, you know, form of spiritual insight and, and uh, content, like you're reading tonight, Raghunath is going to read from the Krishna book, which is a, a, a telling of the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam, which is, a, is the story of Krishna's life. So you can tune in and, you know, begin the process of shravana. You can hear that. And then what that will lead to is the possibility of smarna, that you can go back to what you've heard in your mind and relish it and remember it. And and the very deep levels of smarna are like states of trance where you're actually witnessing the the pastimes of Krishna in your own mind. And that's that's not an easy uh, practice you know, that takes great qualification, but Shravana, we can all do. So it's saying here that you appeared for the sake of rejuvenating devotional service of hearing and remembering, worshiping and so on, because he displays all his pastimes in the earth and they're recorded in the Bhagavatam and then people can hear them and remember them. And so actually what's happening tonight for all those Patreon people that want to tune in is exactly saying Krishna appeared just so that Raghunath could 
read Sweet Baby Krishna tonight and everyone can tune in. And then afterward, everyone can remember it. But uh, yeah. wherever our mind goes, that's our meditation, isn't it? Yeah. Meditation, everybody's meditating at every moment. The, the question is, what are we meditating on? And so the Bhagavatam directs us to bring it back to divinity. When you really focus and your meditation becomes on Krishna, then you start to see Krishna in everything that you do. And that's how we, that start, starts to become how we start to walk this yoga ladder, so to speak, is we start Krishna outside, inside. We start to see Krishna in all the beautiful things in our life and all the reversals in our life. We think, this is Krishna. This is Krishna for my growth. Advancing in Krishna consciousness or our spiritual life doesn't mean everything becomes peaceful. Sometimes it means everything is coming up in my life, right? I can't heal from something I don't even think I have. I have to first understand the disease before I can heal, right? If I think I'm, if I don't even get the fact that I'm an alcoholic, right? There's some people who are actually functioning alcoholics, but they don't get it. They don't, they don't think they have a problem. If they don't get, they can't fix that problem unless you get it. You know, you can't change unless you change. So I have to notice what my problem is. So part of our bhakti path is Krishna, God, the universe, higher power brings things to the surface that we really struggle with. And they put them right in front of our face and they become sort of like almost overwhelming. And that's part of purifying. The Vedic analogy is like when you make ghee, uh, ghee is like clarified butter. You put it on the stove and it brings all the impurities to the surface and then you skim off the impurities. So what's going to happen in our bhakti path is you're going to feel high. You're going to feel blissful. You're going to feel connected. You're going to feel more, you know, in deeply uh, intelligent or wise. And then something's going to come up and it's going to bother you. Generally, it's something in some other person as well. This person's driving me nuts. She's driving me nuts. He's driving me nuts. Why aren't they spiritual like me? And this is all to work on me. It's not to work on them. It appears in one sense, oh, I'm just here to work on them. Let me, let me help you with your problems. It's actually all to work on me. And so all these things are going to come up that you're going to wreck my peace. This is a sign that we're making advancement. We're getting these hurdles. And, they, and the overcoming of these hurdles punctures through the ceiling of our very limited spiritual life so we can go to this next level. And you're going to find different levels and different challenges. And that's part of our evolution in spiritual life. It's not going to be like, now we're spiritual. Woo! Why well, I should have done this years ago. That'll happen also, but we're also going to experience great, great challenges. And it's just, it's just for chiseling away at this ego that's, that's dragging us down. All right. I want to read something here and get your input on this, Raghunath. Sure, my friend. So we go a few sentences into this commentary, then Prabhupada writes, the factual way of religion, or you can say the factual way of religion, the factual way of Dharma is to accept the Lord as the supreme authority and thus render service unto him in spontaneous love. A living being cannot help but render service because he is constitutionally made for that purpose. It's pretty interesting. We're made to render service. We don't even like, especially in American culture, we don't even like that concept of we have to render service. We want to be served. We want servants. But our, the fact is, not only is it natural, it's also sort of joyful. Mm. We love to serve. We serve pets. Anyone who's got a dog serves that dog, especially if you have a dog in New York City. You're actually picking up the feces of the dog. How much <laughs> like humble service is that? <laughs> um, but it's our, it's our position to serve. It, we, you can't escape it. The question is, as Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody. And that's the question. Who are we going to serve? We're going to serve the material world or we're going to serve divinity. 
And um, we just have to choose who we're going to serve. Sometimes we serve a boss and the boss is like a total jerk or we don't trust the boss and we, we don't trust their intentions yet. He's paying me off. It's almost like I'm, it's, it's almost like I'm being bribed. Isn't that what prostitution is? Like I'm selling myself, selling myself. I'm selling my soul for a little bit of money. I'm making this Faustian, right? Faustian bargain with my boss who's a complete jerk. Who are we working for? Who are we giving art to? Who are we giving our mind to? Who are we giving our intelligence to? Who are we giving my creative talent to? For money? I've become a prostitute. I'm a streetwalker. <laughs> the coin drops and Roganoth realizes he's a prostitute all along. Sometimes I laugh. I feel like I'm going to leave my body. Maybe I'll leave my body on the show one day. It's like, what happened to Roganoth? He died on the show. He died it was laughing. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's, um, th there's a point here that a living being cannot help but render service because he's constitutionally made for that purpose. And, and, and the sentence previous, previous to that, it, it mentioned spontaneous love that we serve. So it seems to me like there's two points to be learned here. There's lesson number one. Okay, here's lesson number one, that we're made to serve. That that is what the Atma does. That's what it's created to do. I've told that story uh, to a lot of people here before, but... You know, that once I was in India, I was a monk at the time. This was like 25 years ago or something like that and more. And uh, I was walking down a street early one morning and I met a man uh, who called me. He, he, he asked me where I was from and I said, I'm from America. I'm fr I said, I was from New York. And he said, oh, you're from America. You know, could you help me? And I said, I help you with what? Yeah, I help. I don't know. What, what do you need? And he said, I have something from America, but I don't know how to use it. I said, okay. So he brought me into his little house, which was like basically just like a little one room kind of hut kind of thing. And uh, we sat down on the floor and I said, so how, what, you know, what can I do for you? And he said, um, well, I have a heater from America, but I don't know how to use it. And I said, okay, well, let's take a look. And he, he reached under his bed and slid out a cardboard box. And I looked in the box but it wasn't a heater in the box. It was a waffle iron, right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with a waffle iron in India? <laughs> well, you know, he, so I felt bad because the impression I got was that he probably traded for it or bought it from someone that was telling him it was a heater to heat up his house. And, uh, yeah. and, and so I had to explain to him that this isn't a heater, this is a waffle. I had to explain what a waffle is, right? Aditi, what would you, how would you explain a waffle to, a, to an Indian person that's never seen a waffle before? We've got some Indians listening right now. Our events, um, what, do you know what a waffle is? Here's Aditi, G. Aditi. I would explain it as pancakes. Pancakes are more known there. Okay. It's a different yeah. V-shaped pancake. <laughs> it's a sweet utpam. Oh, sweet utpam would be, yeah, I... I Misty Utapam. Um, yeah, Nancy is saying uh, puffy dosa. What I said was it's like a big jalebi. <laughs> this is not a heater. This makes gigantic jalebis. <laughs> he might have, that, if I would have said it like that, he might have been like, oh, this is even better. <laughs> <laughs> it heats my house and I make jalebi. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but the point is, is that a waffle iron is designed for a particular purpose, right? It makes waffles. And so we could say that the dharma of the waffle iron is to make waffles. And, and when it's doing that, that's, it's, it's doing its purpose. Here, Prabhupada's saying is that a living being cannot help but render service because he is constitutionally made for that purpose. We think we'll be happy when we're being served. And it's, and it's actually backwards. That, that the soul finds happiness through pleasure and through pleasure that through, I'm sorry, finds happiness through service. And it's when the, particularly when the service is done with spontaneous love, right? Love that manifests spontaneously. Um, not that I'm doing it because I'm following some rules or regulations, 
but my heart is naturally driven in this direction. So when we actually love someone, we naturally serve them because our happiness becomes connected to their happiness and we feel good when they feel good. So we serve them so that they feel good and then we feel good. But we think I'm going to feel good when everybody's serving me. So the first lesson number one is that constitutionally we're designed to serve. We'll find happiness, we'll find meaning, we'll find our dharma, our purpose that way. But then the question comes, well, who to serve, right? What will be the, who will be the object of my spontaneous loving service? And, um, and what the Bhagavatam is doing is, is like, we want to clear this up for you once and for all. That when you have a tree, you could try to water this leaf or that leaf. Um, but if you really want to satisfy all the leaves, you go to the root. And mm-hmm. when you water the root, then you connect to every leaf. And so then let's define what is the root of all existence. And then Krishna becomes defined as that root. And so that when you connect with Krishna, who's the divine source of the root of everything, you naturally connect with everything and everyone. Um, and, 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 and that it's possible to connect to everyone through spontaneous love. And so that's called bhakti yoga, kind of clarifying that point. Lesson number one, I'm designed to serve. Lesson number two, serve the root. And then you have a path of yoga that, that's fully connected. All right. I love it. I call it born to give. That's my little hashtag, born to born give. To, born to give, not to take. Right? Not, yeah, because you, because you, what's the point of taking? Because the jiva is not meant to take because the jiva cannot hold on to anything. Everything the jiva gets slides through their fingers. We can't possess anything. So we're just born to give. And the real question is, what do we give? We just, we give love. And where is that directed? Towards divinity. And then it's directed towards divinity. We naturally said, see the in every other person. Yeah. There's that biblical statement. Um, what is it? Again? It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Right? You heard that one? Did your mother tell you that, Robert? Would be a good priest. Huh? I think Kastuba would be a good priest. <laughs> Priestly. My, my mother tried to get me to be an altar boy. I refused. She said, your grandfather would be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you and me should write our, our book, um, Experiments with Catholicism. <laughs> But, 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 you know, I looked into that phrase a little bit. I got a little interested in that phrase. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And oh, I, what I, what's that? Please tell. Yeah, what I found was that um, the, the word that's translated from the original Greek for blessed, if you look at that word, what it really means is happy. Or like one of the meanings, or one of the predominant meanings is happy. And so in a sense, what, what the verse is saying is that one is more blessed with happiness when they give uh, rather than when they receive. And if we're, you know, I think when we're dull, when we're crude, we don't realize that, and that seems counterintuitive. But when we grow up a little bit, when we become a little bit more refined, when, become, when we become a little less superficial, then it becomes apparent to us that this is true and Mm. that the times in our life that are most meaningful to us are the times when we were serving, right? And that the people that we admire most are those that sacrifice the most to serve others. And then, and then it should become clear to us that it's a fact. We are born to serve. That's what we do. That's what we're meant to do. We're meant to serve others. So then that's, that's lesson one. Then lesson two becomes where can I, how can I best serve, you know, who should become the object of that service? And I I once had someone ask me, I was talking about, I was going to talk about bhakti and about service and and someone says, and love, you know, and someone says, well, what about the love that I have for my dog? And so, and I said, no, there's nothing wrong with the love for your dog. But when you love your dog, it doesn't connect you to every other living being in the universe. But if you love the, the root of all existence, you will love your dog. You'll love every other dog. You'll love every living being. You'll love the cockroach. You know, mm. If you just love your dog, you may never get to that point of loving the cockroach. 
But if you love God, you love dog and the cockroach. You know? Good point. Good point. The the tree the tree analogy and the root watering the roots is perfect. It's a strong one. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Text thirty six. Oh Krishna, those who continuously hear, chant, and repeat your transcendental activities, that's what we're doing now. <laughs> or take pleasure in others doing so. Right? Take pleasure. Oh, look what they're doing. They're hearing and chanting and repeating the transcendental activities. Or take pleasure in others doing so. Certainly see your lotus feet, which alone can stop the repetition of birth and death. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about birth and death a little bit? I mean, for some people who don't, there's some people out there who don't get that pain, there's pain in the material world. And they don't think, well, what's wrong with death and birth? That's just the fact of life. It's easy to say sort of everything is great when everything is great. But a lot of times there's a lot of pain in the world. I mean, some of us have had firsthand experiences with excruciating pain. Some of us have had, uh, lived in a bubble of everything's cool. But the idea is that the material body, once you get a body, you've sort of opted in for the pain that goes with this body. And um, we deserve, listen to this, we deserve, it's our birthright to be joyous. Not to have, but it's our birthright to be joyous because the soul itself is born filled with joy. We're not gonna get it on a material, pla on a material plane because good times and bad times, they come and go. It's like a roller coaster. And sometimes it's really up and really down. Um, so that's what we're trying to do in, the, in our spiritual life. It's a practice. Okay, there is a limit to how much fun I can have out there. You see, when a, when a person's in total illusion, they just want fun out there. I want to have fun. But when a person actually gets a little bit introspective, they start to think, well, where's the pleasure? My, my senses all have limitations. I love to eat. I can only eat this much, right? If you love sex, you can only have so much sex. If you love anything that you love of this world through the body, it's got a ceiling of how much you can actually enjoy it. And as you get older, the ceiling gets lower. <laughs> Has that and been your experience? <laughs> definitely. I mean, I could eat as much as I wanted when I was 18 and still look pretty good. But then you hear at a certain age and everything you eat, you start to, be, right? And if I start eating bagels, my wife will go to me. Have you been eating bagels? It's starting to, like, start to look like a bagel. You start to look like one. Is that how it works? She can tell? There are certain foods that you eat, you start to look like those foods. Calzones. You start to look like a calzone. <laughs> bagels. My belly starts to look like a bagel. Bagel shaped. So anyway... As you get older, yeah, the ceiling gets lower. So then we start to feel, hey, can't I find some pleasure that's not out there where I'm running around? How can I find pleasure? I'm going to travel here to get pleasure. I'm going to travel there to get pleasure. I'm going to meet, be with this person. Now this person's bored me. I'm going to switch to this person. And so the whole life, our whole life in the material world becomes a mad pursuit for chasing down pleasure. And here comes the coronavirus. The silver lining, right? You're going to stay right here and you're going to find pleasure from not doing nothing except going inside, getting right back to these basics, getting meditative, getting thoughtful, committing some time to your spiritual life. If we want to see changes, we got to change. We got to tweak some things. So the universe says, okay, well, you're, you, you're trying to find your pleasure from going out all how about that? Uh, you lagged. You say it again. You want to find pleasure going out and then what? Find pleasure going out? Yeah, then. You can't. All you can't. flights are canceled. Gotcha. Lockdown. You can't even leave unless you're, <laughs> what's it, what do they call it? A necessary. Essential. Essential. An essential, right? That, what you were saying, you were, you were questioning, okay, what's the problem with birth and death? It's lockdown. That's the problem, right? It's like you're not free. You're stuck in a cycle. 
Yeah. So we're, we are trying to find some freedom from going out and just, and, and our real pleasure comes from going in. And we have this great opportunity to go inside right now. <laughs> Aren't we fortunate? We are. Right? In the material world, we see a lockdown as, this is horrible. I can't go anywhere. And the spirit, with a spiritual lens, you see, what a great opportunity has just come upon me. I can't go anywhere. I'm forced to go here. It's, it's cool. <laughs> <sighs> well, by the way, that's a, a lot of us, but some people are working extra hard to take care of us. I want to give a shout out to all those, who is it? Doctors, uh, nurses, healthcare people, who else? Delivery people. Delivery people. people delivery bring, people. Thank you for delivering things to us. People bringing food into the city. Yes. Sanitation truckers. workers. Some truckers. Some Gross. truckers are still working. Out Grocery there. store workers. Police. police. Police officers. Yeah. Truck drivers. Yeah. Sean. Sean Murphy. A vegan truck driver. Our very own G vegan truck driver. He's the guy delivering the vegan uh, tofu dogs to everybody. He's just truckloads of vegan products. <laughs> 18 wheelers filled with uh, plant-based burgers. <laughs> so there's a, there's a, in the commentary here, it's okay. Let, let's, let me just read this verse again. Oh, Krishna, those who continuously hear, we talked about that shravana chant and repeat your transcendental activities. That's what we're doing. Um, or take pleasure in others doing so. You just have to appreciate that others are doing it even. They certainly see your lotus feet, which alone can stop the repetition of birth and death. And, you know, Krishna has this name Mukunda, right? That, he, that he's the grantor of liberation from birth and death. But there's a statement here. He says, the, the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna cannot be seen by our present conditional vision, right? With these eyes, we don't see him. There has to be some spiritual qualification beyond just the material eyes. In order to see him, one has to change his present vision by developing a different condition of life full of spontaneous love of God. When Sri Krishna was personally present on the face of the globe, not everyone could see him as the Supreme. Materialists like Ravana, Hiranyakashipu, Kangsa, Jarasandha, and Shishupal what a lineup, huh? Well, well, the point is, it's like they were standing face to face with Krishna. Yeah. And they still couldn't see him and who he was. Even, even Prabhupada says here, they were all highly qualified personalities by acquisition of material assets. Hmm. But they were unable to appreciate the presence of the Lord. Therefore, even though the Lord may be present before our eyes, it is not possible to see him unless we have the necessary vision. The necessary yes, qualification is developed by the process of devotional service only, beginning with hearing Shravanam about the Lord from the right sources. It's in that point by the right sources is is so important. Prabhupada is going to say a little further down here. If hearing is from the right sources, it acts very quickly. Right? I see people get that from you, Raghu. I'm going to little praise of Raghu right here. You ready? No, I'm not right. Coming, that. that that I see that like when people like people go with you, they go uh, like on a trip to India, and then they'll go to this holy place. And of course, there's the power of the holy place. But what I see is that when people hear from you, they begin to see Krishna in a different way very quickly. It's like what could take many years. You know, you kind of have some way of like you must be the right source because it seems to act very quickly with you because I listen to you. I hear from the right source. I hear from the right source and therefore I can give it away. You hear from Radhana Swami. I think I'm, 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 merely just a, I'm merely just a parrot repeating what you and Radhana Swami say. Well, you seem effective at it, you know. I'm and, one effective parrot. <laughs> that, but that's great. And, um, and, you know, but I was thinking when I read this of that, um, that, passage in the 10th canto or in the Krishna book about how people see Krishna in different ways. Oh yeah. We were both, all right, check this out, everybody. Me and Kasuba were 
both randomly reading the exact same thing. It's not reading the same thing, yeah. And what was that? It was uh, the killing of Kamsa. Krishna enters the wrestling arena. And he, it's such a great story because he's a little boy. Yeah, he has to. And Kamsa made him. <laughs> you can't make up these stories. They lured Krishna into a giant, like, sports, like the Staples Center. And he's got to wrestle these giant, like, WWE or what's it called? WWF wrestlers. These gigantic wrestlers. And even Krishna's going, this is totally unfair. You guys are adults. We're just a bunch of children. You're gonna you're gonna make us wrestle you. And even the wrestle wrestlers were like, "We know who you are, Krishna. We know you're not ordinary. We've seen what you've done. We've heard the stories." And um, wrestling match between two little boys and this like not just one a gang of others. And that's the story. <laughs> so so there's when he enters that arena the the staple center as you presented it it said that everybody that was looking at him saw him in a different way and there's a lot of meaning to this because the idea is we understand god according to the state of our own heart mm. and so um I, I'll, I'll read a bit from that about how different people saw him differently it says that he appeared different to different people according to their different relationships or russes with him Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure and all kinds of rasas, both favorable and unfavorable. He appeared to the wrestlers exactly like a thunderbolt. To the people in general, he appeared as the most beautiful personality. To the females, he appeared to be the most attractive male, Cupid personified, and thus he increased, he increased their desire. The cowherd men who were present there looked upon Krishna as their own kinsmen, coming from the same village of Vrindavan. So they had this kind of very sweet sentiment. You know? The impious warrior kings who were present saw him as the strongest ruler and their chastiser. To the parents of Krishna, Nanda Yashoda, he appeared to be the most loving child. So one person seen him, seen him as a thunderbolt. Someone seen him as you know, the, 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 the strongest ruler. Someone seen him as the most beautiful lover. Someone seeing him as a loving child. To Kamsa, the king of the Bhoja dynasty, he appeared as death personified. To the unintelligent, he appeared to be an incapable personality. Like he's just a boy. How's he going to fight these wrestlers? Mm. To the yogis present, he appeared to be as? The super soul. The super soul, the paramatma, that, that manifestation of Lord Vishnu within the heart of every living being. To the members of the Vrishni dynasty, he appeared to be the most celebrated ascendant. Thus appreciated this different, right different kinds of people present. Krishna entered the wrestling arena with Balaram and his cowherd boyfriends. It's pretty cool, huh? I'm going to add this to my Krishna trivia game. I've been working on <laughs> Each one of those? Yeah, How did each he one of them. To this one. How did he appear to that one? Yeah. Have you made a game like that? I, I've been working on it for years in different pieces. I think the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita turned that into a game, you know, mm. of, of rivers. I am the, ah, oh. I think that's our, oh. of rivers, I of flowing rivers. I am the of trees. I am the Ashwata, right? Mm. Of Pandavas, I am Arjuna. Of, se of seasons, I am. Flower bearing spring. Flower bearing spring. Of stars, I am. The radiant sun. I think it's the moon, isn't it? I may be wrong. Maybe you're right. It's the sun. The moon, I am. Of, the, of, of men, I am the monarch. I'm the man, the monarch. Hey, thanks everybody for joining the show. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, go there and give us four and a half stars. Just kidding. Give us five stars. Write a good review. It helps our ranking. And, uh, Everybody else, join us this evening. Did I say 7 or 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock. 8, 8 o'clock, we're going to do Krishna Book. And uh, join our Patreon account. It's patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. Go there right now and join it. And uh, thanks for everybody. Let wisdom of the sages be your shelter. Let the Srimad Bhagavatam be our shelter if we go through hard times. we got a super strong community. Had about 97 people today. 
And thanks for everybody who joined late here on Zoom as well. Have a great day today. It's time to dance. Everybody join late, including my daughter, Sachi, uh, Buckman G, people new to the show, like Brain Eggs, <laughs> Tomas from Germany. Ah, oh, Katie Felice and Baby Rasika and Jai, Jai Balai. Good morning. Jay Shri Krishna. It's time to make that namaste. There's something magical about dancing. I can't figure it out. Oh, I wish you could see Mara. She's going crazy dancing right now, spinning around the room. That's what I'm talking about, John Couturier dance. Julie Blondina, good morning. I gotta go to the back pages. Kamania, thanks for joining us today. Amy Stellar's off the charts, waking up the kids. Good morning. Everybody, karaoke, come on. Oh, yeah. 